Hi, I'm Jim Doty and welcome to Dialogue. We have at Chapman University the privilege to have Dr. Eli Wiesel, one of the world's great humanists, humanitarians, scholars, authors with us this week as a presidential fellow. And I have the privilege of talking with Dr. Wiesel today about an amazing book that he's recently written. It's on all the bestseller lists, uh, Open Heart. Uh, Dr. Wiesel, welcome to Dialogue. It's truly uh, uh, an honor to have you on our campuses this week. It's a pleasure to come back, always. Yeah, well, thank you. This you, have, is... you have great students and great faculty. Well, that's music to my ears, especially the great students. Uh, and to, to give our students an opportunity to interact with you in a personal way uh, makes the learning environment that much more exciting and invigorating. That's what, that's what Chapman is all about. Well, to me too. Well, thank you. Thank you for being a partner in that. Well, let me tell you, uh, this is an amazing book. Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, on all the bestseller lists right now, Open Heart, uh, a relatively short book. Uh, I think only 80 or so pages. And uh, it's about your recent open heart surgery, which must have come as a shock to you. Why did you write this book, Dr. Wiesel? Because I have a problem with my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, Actually, there are other people who have had open heart <laughs> surgery, but you decided that it was worthy of a book. Strangely, you know, I, I had all, so all kinds of diseases and all kinds of pains. I suffer from migraine headaches all my life, this kind of thing. Never with my heart. And this time, actually, I went to Israel and came back. And next day, I had to go for the usual annual checkup. And my cardiologist said, you are all right. Go back. You can work. <laughs> Everything is good. Two days later, I was in the middle of a meeting with Iranian dissidents. You know, I'm a kind of patron of all kinds of, of victims and dissidents. And we spent. So it's some of stressful situation. Naturally. Yeah. After other people's pain is stressful. And then all of a sudden, my, my uh, doctor calls me and said, I need to see you. I said, come on, I cannot. I'm in the middle of this. He said, because I of need... the previous test. Yeah, but I, I said, I cannot. He said, please, I'm your doctor. And I be, we began arguing. And I'm very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so we made a very deal. good at that. So we made a deal at 12 o'clock. It was 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning. And I came, for some reason, I don't know why, I took my wife with me, Marion. The moment I arrived, they were waiting for me. <laughs> That's not a good they sign. They were waiting for me. That's not <laughs> a good sign. An hour later, I was You don't want a lot of attention <laughs> when it comes to things like uh, this. An hour later, I was already in surgery. That quickly? That quickly. Open heart surgery? Open heart surgery. So it was that dangerous? It was very dangerous. I had no idea. Zero idea. But the doctor, the surgeon in the middle, said, you know, Eddie, I wanted to know that this <laughs> is op open heart. I thought first, you know, exams, open heart. And it had to be done quickly. So, all right, what can I do? So what I describe here in this, in, in this book is exactly how it happened and what happened. You know. Well, Dr. Wiesel, it's, it's, when I started this book, I thought it would be about your experience in the hospital and what it's like to go through open heart surgery. Obviously, some of the pain and discomfort and so on. But Dr. Wiesel is much more than that. It's, uh, it's a philosophical work. It's an inspirational book. I noticed on Amazon.live, it's, it's, it's number eight in religious and spirituality bestsellers, number eight in, uh, in Amazon. And you cover a wide, wide range of subjects. You became, during this period, a very introspective person. Maybe you are naturally. Yes and no, <laughs> not like that. Yeah. Uh, at one point, I felt I may not survive. Yeah. And therefore, when you have that idea in your head, and you're feeling, uh, you think differently. And I guess you, you become more introspective if you feel that your your days, your hours are, are numbered. Who knows? I may and not. And you get think up. about your life. I may not get up. Yeah. So you think, what have I done with my life until now? If it ends like that. So therefore, it was a very special uh, uh, experience, really. You mentioned just earlier, Dr. Wiesel, that uh, you've had a life where you had migraine headaches. Uh, and that recalled a memory in reading this book. Uh, you, you wrote that uh, you had 
as a young boy, migraine headaches, but then you go to Birkenau, yeah. Birkenau, the first day, a death camp, and these migraine headaches go away, and then when you get out of the camp in, in France, I believe Paris, they come back. But you didn't explain why. <laughs> I don't know why. You know? Actually, I, 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 I gave uh, all kinds of lectures to uh, medical conferences, and I asked some of the, high, of, of, of the experts in the field, explain it to me. How come that the moment I entered Auschwitz, they disappeared? The moment I left, they came back. <laughs> they have no answer. So I didn't miss something in the book no, because no, no, I'm no, looking absolutely. for the explanation. There there's isn't no, there's any. There's no explanation. Isn't that, that's Maybe it was pressure, a, a different kind of pressure. Different ty type of yeah, pressure. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I have a few things that I noted in here, and I, the, the, our readers, uh, our uh, viewing audience who, will be, who have read or will read the book uh, might have the same questions uh, I do or ask you to comment a, a little bit more about it. Uh, it's amazing in this book how important family was to you in your recovery during this process, both Miriam, your wife, and your son, Elijah. Uh, you mentioned uh, here, uh, Marion and Elisha stand next to the gurney, waiting to accompany me to the door of the operating room. Marion looks sad and forlorn. For once, there's nothing she can do. You speak so well of the, I think, people who experience health problems. There, this feeling of inadequacy, the, the caregivers, what can I do to help? She usually knows how to resolve difficult situations, but now she is vainly trying to find words to alleviate my fears. There probably are none. And then later in the book you talk about your grandson, and uh, could you relate that? There's a wonderful... Uh, moment there with your grandson, if you could relate well, that, I, what he said to you. I, I'm in love with my grandson. Yeah. Literally, we have such a relationship of love, really. Yeah. And he came to the hospital. He sat on my bed. And he said, Grandpa, I know that you suffer a lot. I know that. But you know that I love you a lot. Tell me, if I love you more, will you suffer less? That's so wonderful. <laughs> 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 what did you do when he said I that? I said, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, it works. <laughs> you're serious, sure. you're serious, oh, yes. I'll said, take all the love oh, I can I get. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> so how important was oh, your family? Naturally. Remember, you know, that I come, my background, my background during the war. You lost your family. Lost my family, of course. Your uh, sister, your parents. My little sister, my parents. I, I discovered my other sisters later on, but then uh, I was with my father until he died. So family is important. It was important then. And the moment, you know, I became fatherless, I became an orphan, a real orphan. Uh, that it, it changes one's life. It means something in life to become an orphan. Mm -hmm. Until then, of course, if I had gone through with my, with my introspection, I would have known that my mother and my little sister had gone the first night. But we didn't think that. We were afraid of thinking through that possibility. Yeah, sure that you have hope. For that yeah. certainty, it was yeah. certain, uh, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, my, my little sister was too young and my, my mother would have been with her together, but with my father. So I was, as long as I was with my father, my life had meaning. I wanted to live because of him. I knew if I die, he would die. Speaking of your father, there's a wonderful passage in here, if I can find it here. Oh, here it is. I see my father at the camp. We were inseparable there. Never had we been so close, so united. Can one die more than once? One could there. During the death march, the night of the evacuation from Buna, and then during the nocturnal journey in the snow, there again we were together. I protected him, and he protected me. Our only disagreement, this is a very poignant uh, passage, he wanted me to accept a portion of his miserable bread ration, pretending that he was not hungry. I used the same ploy, each of us wishing to offer the other one more moment of survival. These thoughts entered your mind course, during this, this time. Remember, I thought it was the end. 
I thought, heart, I had never anything to do with my heart. The moment I realized when the, the surgeon told me it's urgent, it's an emergency, you have immediately to have heart surgery, I, I knew very well it, it could have been the end. Surgery in general, but heart surgery, my God. Uh, and therefore, whatever important moment you had in, one li in one's life, and life is made of moments, not of years, the, all these moments actually emerged, and I really lived them one after the other, one within the other. So at a time like this, when you're facing a, a possibility of death, one begins to relive one's life. As a question mark, what have I done with my life? Look, it's true, I never thought I would be so old, after all, surely not in those years. And I'm asking myself, survival for what have I done? What have I done with my life? Uh, sure, I created a family and I have friends and I taught and I wrote. Nevertheless, the question is a good question. What have I done? You, you ask that question in the book, you, Dr. Vissal, you say, have I done enough? Have I, have I, have, have I written enough? Uh, and I it's written? somewhat yeah. sad or uh, tragic in a way because you say, I've worked for peace, for, for justice, and there isn't justice, there isn't peace. Have I failed? True. So, one thing is clear. The inner truth matters. Whatever remains is the quest for inner truth. Not to be a fool, not to fool myself, not to cheat myself, but to live in truth, with truth, and for truth. And in those moments, really, you want truth. If I have to die, I want to know it. I want to live until the last moment. And therefore, you become very clear. There's a certain lucidity. That, that, that invades you, your mind and your memory, everything is lucid. I want to know, which means since I'm going to die, I want to know that I'm going to die, that I will die. I didn't protest, I didn't fight it, I just wanted to know. But that, you know, is part of, uh, of our upbringing, the knowledge at least, not, not to be another when I die. I want to be myself. Oh, to be myself, I have to know myself. And therefore, the kind of this self-examination, have I done enough? And where was I wrong? Where did I go wrong? Uh, what book have I written and shouldn't have written? What words have I uttered and I should not have uttered? All this, in, it's very, you know, it's a lot of subjects. Is uh, that a philosophical belief, Dr. Vissel, or is that a Jewish religious belief of the self-examination? Oh, I think it's not only Jewish. Socrates had, a, I don't compare myself, of course, to Socrates. S Socrates had exactly the same, the same attitude towards that. I, I never understood that, uh, really, because he was actually sentenced to exile or death. And he chose death. Yes. Why not exile? Yes. Well, I have chosen exile <laughs> until then. <laughs> you didn't follow his... Uh uh, example. Here's another wonderful passage I would like to ask you about. A great journalist, a friend, in a televised conversation asked me what I would say to God as I stood before him. I answered with one word, why? And God's answer, if in his kindness, as we say, he actually communicated his answer, I don't recall it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Look, why? That is the question of all questions. Why? Why such life? Why such pain? And why such pain when I witness it in others and I'm helpless to help them? Why? All that is why. Why is the world in such a poor shape? And why are so people indifferent? So many. The why, 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 of course, this is a philosophical question. That's, that's but he philosophy. didn't answer you. I don't have an answer. <laughs> and he didn't answer you. Maybe, maybe uh, God doesn't know the well, answer. Well, you later, and uh, you later begin to question God or 
religion, and, 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 and I want to ask you about this. You say, in, in truth, for the Jew I am, Auschwitz is not only a human a tragedy, but also, and most of all, a theological scandal. For me, it is impossible to accept Auschwitz with God as without God. But then how is one to understand his silence? I don't. That is the question. Well, I don't. But I'm asking. <laughs> you keep asking. Oh, I keep asking. Maybe one day he will, but no. But you it consider depends. yourself a religious person at the same time you don't have that the answer to that why or how a loving God would permit this to his children. Those creatures. My dear friend, I consider myself a religious person, not so much for myself, but I don't want to abandon my father and my grandfather and his father and grandfather. I belong to a long tradition of, of rabbinic scholars and I, I cannot do that. I don't want to abandon them and I want them to abandon me. That is why really I continue, continue, if I may say this, in, in my way, in, in religion, I did not give up religious behavior, religious practice, only because of them, not because of God, but because of them. And I think that the entire event that I had here, the entire episode with my sickness, is really a, a, an act of faith and fidelity in my parents and my forebears. But it, it seemed like your, your, your spirituality was critical or important in, in this process of thankfully healing uh, during, your, your, during this experience. I don't know. I really don't know what healed me. Of course, the doctors and, and naturally, and I'm grateful to them. And, and to my friends and my family and my son and my grands, all that they helped, certainly, but I don't know why I survived. Just as I don't know why I survived in 1940, 40, 44, 45, I have no idea. I have never done anything there simply to survive. But how you've written more than 50 books, you, you, you've had an incredible, an enormous impact on our life and times, Dr. Wiesel. You're a great humanitarian of the world. Yet, at the same time, you ask yourself, in a way, have I failed? Have I not succeeded in my life uh, during this time now when it may be coming to an end? Well, because I want to be true to myself, a bit myself, not to, not to live a long life or the life of someone else. I am not sure, through, I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, I'm a friend, a good friend to my friends, but I don't know what I have done. I don't know why, really why I survived. As so many others have not. Uh, was I better? Surely not. So is it I believe in God? Of course, if I do, then God would say I did it, and therefore say thank you, <laughs> okay, thank you God. Uh, not enough. If God was so kind to me in keeping me alive, he could have done a little bit more and saved a few more like me or better than me. So God does not get off lightly here in my, in mm -hmm. my, in, in my conversation mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. But then this is a Jewish tradition, the Hasidic tradition. We have the right to argue with God. <laughs> it's not only in the Bible, Moses Many argued. Many people probably don't realize that. No, no, of course, we have the right, absolutely. Moses uh, argued with God, and the prophets argued with God. The masters in the Talmud argued with God. So why not argue with God if you have faith in God? Without faith, why argue? But if you have faith in God, if you are a believer, of course you may argue with God from inside faith, not from outside faith. And this is what I'm trying to do always, I can, uh, but with humility, without arrogance. So this is actually, you know, if, look, I am, I'm with you here, and you know, I, I, I came for the third year, I think, and you have a very great school, 
great university. And Thank you. Uh, you know, that's really in truth, you know, I can... And you help make it a great you know, school. In truth, because, you know, I, I, in tr I must tell the truth. I came here as because of your professor of Marilyn uh, Haran, and she's a great professor and a good friend. She became a good friend. And uh, I enjoy every minute of it. Yeah. Although I teach at Boston University, that's my permanent chair. But I love it. The week I spend with you and your students and your, and your faculty, really it's a joy. I met so many of your professors here in all kinds of, on, on many occasions. They are all so good, really, as professors, as human beings, as teachers, as friends to their students. It's, it's a joy to be with you. Well, if you begin, ever begin to question whether you had, if you did enough in your lifetime, let me say that when you are a teacher, and I know the experience that students have at Chapman, and I know my experience in being a part of this, this week-long period as presidential fellow here at Chapman, you've gotten inside the heads of people. You're inside my head. And in a way, when I think of the world and react to things, Elie Wiesel is a part of me. Uh, and you are part of many of our students, and your legacy will continue as a result of that. Well, I can say the same thing about you and your students. I came here, and, and now you are a part. It's every year. Isn't that a great you, part of teaching? Because it's that sure. teacher-student relationship. You learn so much from students. You learn so much more about yourself. They, wonderful students, demanding students, critical students, thinking students, stretch you. Yeah. In amazing you ways. Know, you know, it's, a Talmudic sage said, more than I have learned from my teachers, I learned from my friends. <laughs> and more than I have learned from my friends, I learned from my students, from my pupils. Yeah. It is true. Each time I come into a class, I learn so much from my students. Yeah. They don't even realize it, but I learn so much. As, well, as I learned from, from our conversations, you know, we know each other already for a few years and, yes. you know, the and I, affection I, I have I treasure you, that you relationship. Know. Dr. Wiesel, uh, you, uh, thankfully, uh, uh, for, very fortunately for our world, you survived this. And uh, you mentioned that you have miles to go before you sleep, uh, many, many other projects. What, what, what do you have in the future? What are some of your goals that you'd like to accomplish? More books. More books, okay. <laughs> more Well, if teaching. you could write more books like this, oh. that would be a wonderful addition to this world, believe me. The one that I've been writing for the last two years, actually, is called My Teachers and My Friends. Who were my teachers? Going back to Moses or Socrates, and to this day, and who are my friends? And it's, it's going to be, I, I, I hope, a good book. I'm reading and another I, book of yours right now, by the way. It's a, one of your a book you've written a while ago. He, Heroes of the World, I think was the name of it. Uh, heroes, and people that had an impact. Impact teachers. on me. Yeah, a, but this time a will wonderful, be on me. wonderful book. What else can I do except tell tales? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of telling tales, one thing I need to ask you about is you're you're one of the most articulate people I know in mm. in the English language, and you wrote this in your fr in French. All my books are in French. In French. Yeah. But your lovely wife, Marion, translated it. She's How does that collaborative process work, and why didn't you translate it? It's not good enough. My, my English is not good enough, really. I'm not so, I, I, I respect language so much. French, I, I dominate. It's my language. Although I learned it late in my life when I came to France. When I came to France, I didn't know a word of French. But I needed a language, a new language, to begin a new life. And therefore, I, I studied, went to the Sorbonne, and uh, that's how really it happened. But it's, it's French. So all my light, writing here is in French. Well, I have to thank Marion because she did a she's wonderful good. job. She's, it's very, a, she's it's, very good. It's, really. it's a very erudite book, but beautifully written. You feel like you're not just reading an uh, autobiographical account. You're... you're it's almost like poetry. You, you, the viewing audience heard those right. passages. It's beautifully written. Well, that's from the French, but the translation, well, a wonderful good. translation, she is, very is good essential. Here. Oh, my wife is very good. She, yeah. she, also, she speaks six or seven languages. Wonderful, my but goodness. her translation is always the best. So she knows my voice. 
That's important. You know, writing is a voice, and translating is a voice. Yeah. And she knows my voice, and, and also beloved child. Well, she did a wonderful job, and you're a great team. And Dr. Vissel, thank you so much for writing it. Thank you for being on the show and sharing your thoughts with a wider audience. But most of all, thank you for being part of our Chapman University community, being with our students, and making the Chapman environment this week particularly exciting, dynamic, and involving. Thank you so much for everything. My friend. Thank you, my friend. Funding for this program was provided by Chapman University.